The grocery store was crowded and the parking lot was equally packed. The older man crept around looking for an empty spot where he could safely park his car. Then the sky parted and it seemed that this 80 year old man all of a sudden saw a prime spot that had just been vacated. He drove right past it and got all set up so that he would be able to back his car safely into this precious real estate. But as he was getting ready to back up, at just that instant, a hotshot 25 year old saw the opening and he whipped his sleek little sports car into the spot before the old timer even knew what hit him. As the cocky kid got out of his convertible, he walked past the frustrated senior citizen and said, now that's what you can do when you're young and fast. Older man nodded, put his old Cadillac in reverse, <laughs> crumpled the sports car like it was an accordion. He said, that's what you can do when you're old and rich. <laughs> For the next two weeks, we're going to take a look at the blessings and the challenges of the different generations, the older generation and the younger generation. And I don't intend to further clarify what the breakdown is of those categories. So you can make your own classifications and your own applications. But the Bible has a lot to say to both young and old. And it even talks about the benefits that come from interaction between the two groups. So in this brief series, we wanna be aware of some blind spots we may have that sometimes accompany the season of life that we find ourselves in. And Southeast is a very unique church for a variety of reasons. But one reason is that we are one of the few extremely large churches who are multi-generational. And by that, I mean that there are some extremely large churches that are predominantly older people. And there are some extremely large churches that are predominantly just young people. But we are very blessed in that we are very balanced in our membership. And we have a lot of all ages. I asked some questions of several hundred of our senior citizens and also several hundred of our students in our church. And in these two weeks, I wanna try and summarize some of the themes that I came across. Now, in a balanced, multi-generational church, it allows for disciple-making to take place as the older teach the younger. But it also allows for the energy and the vitality that youth bring with them to permeate the programming and the spirit of the church. It's never healthy when it is an us versus them mentality. And we can all learn from each other. And today we wanna to learn from the older generation and see just what it is that we can glean from their years of experience. But rather than warnings, I, I, I like the approach of, of challenging. And I like the idea of the older one setting the example. That's what Paul talks about in Titus chapter two, verses six and seven. He says, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. So we don't wanna simply warn the youth to avoid bad things, we want to challenge them to greater things. And the older generation of our church can have a lot of great things to say to the younger generation. And these can bring out the best in the best years. And when God takes center stage in these things, Christian examples and the suggestions of veterans can serve as a springboard to send this church and God's kingdom all around the world to new heights. Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 31, gray hair is a crown of splendor. It is attained in the way of righteousness. That verse means more and more to me each year, I've noticed. <laughs> and the Bible is filled with examples of older adults who have exemplified faith and have set an example for us. And fortunately for us, as a church, we have many who have modeled uh, the person of Jesus Christ. And they can say with the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, from the survey that, that I gave, I've tried to summarize some principles that the older generation believes would be helpful to pass along to the younger generation. And the first one is this, the first theme is value people over technology. Now the world that we live in is quite different than when the Bible was written. Back then it was an agrarian world. Uh, the temptations were different. 
but still there were obstacles that kept people from having relationships and friendships with others. And we have to acknowledge that technology is a part of all of our lives. You might say, well, I don't know the first thing about technology. Well, if you've got a phone in your house somewhere, whether it's a landline, whatever it is, you have some technology. Same with the TV. So yes, it's moving quickly, and we live in a world where our, our lives are dominated by technology. But notice, it's not just kids. It's a part of our culture. And so as a result of that, we need to learn how it is that we can, we can function with it. A businessman from Wisconsin went on a trip down to Florida. Upon arrival at his hotel in Florida, he opened up his laptop and he whipped off a quick email and he sent it back to his wife, Jennifer Johnson. But in his haste to send that to her and let her know that he made it safely, he, he made one mistake. He, he mistyped one character in the email address and instead of it going to Jennifer Johnson, his wife, it went to a Gene Johnson who lived in a totally different state. Now that wouldn't have been a problem except for the fact that Gene Johnson was married to a preacher and her husband had passed away three days earlier and the funeral service had just happened that day. She just buried her husband. So imagine her surprise when she came home and she opened up her email and the pastor's wife read an email that was signed from her hubby, and she promptly fainted. Here's what it said. Arrive safely, but it sure is hot down here. <laughs> P.S. Looking forward to your arrival on Friday. <clears throat> so technology can be a great thing. It can be a bummer sometimes, too. What's funny is that the youth said on the survey they want to learn from the older generation how to become less dependent on technology. While the older generation in their surveys and what they could learn from kids said, oh, please teach us technology. Show us how to do technology. How can I set up my, my VCR or my DVR? How can I change the time on my microwave? You know, all of these issues, right? But time and time again, the older folks wanted to convey to the younger folks the importance of putting the cell phone down every once in a while and not pursuing material things to satisfy, but having genuine conversations with people. Several wrote on their survey, set your phone aside. Give us your undivided attention. Look us in the eyes. I was listening on Friday to focus on the family uh, to their radio broadcast and and their guest was Gary Chapman and a friend of mine, Arlene Pelican, and they have authored a brand new parenting book called Growing Up Social. And Arlene shared the story of how there was a young man who was 18, he graduated from high school, his family threw a big party for him. He was there with the guest for the first 10 minutes of the party. And then he went up to his bedroom and closed the door and began playing video games and no amount of coaxing would be able to get him to come out for the rest of the party. This is a strange world. Something is wrong. We are raising a generation who will not be able to survive a face-to-face -face interview for a job because they have never learned how to communicate verbally with one another and to socialize with others. In Matthew chapter six, you're well aware of the fact that Jesus says not to store up treasures on, on earth, but to store up treasures in heaven. It's talking about different material things and, and things that we accumulate on this earth that we can't take with us to heaven. And I think technology falls into that category. You see, you can't take that to heaven. Not your iPhone, not your laptop, not your iPad. What makes it to heaven with us? people. It's the only thing you can take. is someone that you introduce to Jesus Christ and, the, and they make Christ the, the Lord and Savior of their life. People, that's the only thing. One of our senior citizens who I have a great deal of respect for wrote what was on her heart to the younger generation. She said, be patient with us. We walk slower. Walk with us. Help us with our electronics. Encourage us to do Facebook and emails. Call us sometimes, text us often, 
send us photos, visit us. And then she has in all capital letters, answer your phone when we call. Hmm. (laughs) Hear voices, see faces, hug. You know, technology is just like money. It's amoral, It's, it's neither good nor bad. It simply depends on whose hands it's in. And young people, if it is used in moderation with boundaries, it can be a valuable asset to your life and to your communication. But understand that you are the one who determines whether it becomes all-consuming or whether it is a useful tool to connect people to Jesus and one another. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. In other words, his presence is more important than your possessions. One of the oldest books provides greater wisdom than the newest technology. Here's a second piece of advice for those who are younger. And that is develop a heart of service over entitlement. In other words, don't have your hand out expecting. One of the things that the older people said was, I think a lot of times the young people just expect things to be handed to them. And they're not grateful for it. And they don't have the work ethic that matches it. By the way, this this message that you're hearing is, is what our teenagers are listening to today over in the block. They're hearing the exact same message that you are. And there's a recurring theme among our older folks, and that is be grateful for what you receive. And I sit up and take notice of that because we have a number of older folks in our church who are grateful and who are super servants and who knock themselves out serving people regardless of whether they get any attention for it or not. We hear all the time that the teens in the 20s love service projects. They love getting their hands dirty through serving. And you need to know you are needed, young people. We, we, we desperately need you serving. We want you to develop that heart and that passion for others. Our new Southwest campus is, is having its official grand opening uh, next weekend. And we need people who have already been approved to help volunteer with children. We need those people serving in the children's ministry there for the first couple of months because we have no idea how many people God might bring. We don't know if God's gonna bring 500 people next week. We don't know if he'll bring 800. We don't know if he'll bring 1,000. We've we've gotta be prepared. And at each of our campuses, we have so many senior adults who volunteer and they derive incredible fulfillment from serving others. And we've got a lot of young people who do as well. We have a Christian woman in our church her name's Nancy Stanberry. And she's just one of these gals who just loves to serve. She's worked with a variety of different uh, parachurch organizations in, in the city. She's, she's spent countless hours serving here at Southeast. I remember when we were building these facilities here at the Blankenbaker campus, she wanted this to be the cleanest work site in all of Jefferson County. And so she volunteered and said, I'd like to oversee a whole team of volunteers that I would recruit. And they would help to keep this place clean throughout the entire uh, construction project. Well, the construction project lasted three years. A long time. Nancy volunteered between 60 and 70 hours a week for three years, and she never got paid a penny. She did it for free. She loved it. It was her service. I've never seen anything like it. I remember coming in one time, bringing a friend who I picked up at the airport, brought him here at one o'clock. It was the only time he could see the construction and how it was going. I showed him around. All of a sudden, I heard some noise up by the chapel. And there was Nancy at one in the morning on top of the scaffolding and she was putting plastic over the, over the stained glass windows. I said, Nancy, what are you doing? It's after one in the morning. She said, the painters are coming at six in the morning and I'm just afraid that they might splatter some paint and then get on this beautiful stained glass. That was Nancy. That is Nancy. After we moved into these facilities, We had Nancy come to one of our all staff meetings with our entire staff there and I brought her up front and told the story about her and everybody gave her a standing ovation and I gave her a a gift certificate. We're a very generous church. Uh, Hope she likes Captain D's. Uh, (laughs) But I said, you wanna share a few words? And to my surprise, she said, yes, I would. 
And this was her entire speech. She stood in front of all the staff, she paused for a minute and then she said, it's not about me, it's about him. And then she sat down. And her index finger pointed heavenward, may have well have been sign language for servanthood. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, another thing that we learn from the older generation is to learn to practice delayed gratification. We are living in a world that is impulsive and we want what we want and we want it now. Jesus says in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 31, he says, do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Notice it doesn't say that the pagans walk after these things. It says the pagans run after these things. We get wrapped up in where we're gonna eat, what we're gonna drink, and the clothes that we're going to buy. And we're in such a hurry to have. And we have such a passion to possess. And we are in pursuit of all the things that God says, hey, just trust me on this. But we can't wait. We want the quick fix rather than the healthy process that leads to genuine healing and life change. We live in such a a, a hurried life, in a hurried world. Our culture isn't described as a people of patience. I mean, think about it. We are the only nation on earth that has a mountain named Rushmore. (laughs) That describes us, that's who we are. We're in a hurry. That sums up our culture. We're always on the move. And if patience is a virtue, then that means that hurry is not. And we have to remember what the psalmist, Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. Did you know that our students realize their need for godly wisdom and older examples? Because of the top three things that they told me they wanted to learn from senior adults, One of those top three is financial responsibility. And it makes me wonder if they have heard snippets of of stories from their grandparents and, and how they did without and how they practiced delayed gratification. And at the same time, they've overheard plenty of discussions and arguments among their parents who are dealing with debt and the suffocating effect of of buying wants rather than needs. That's why back in 2011, we challenged our church members to get out of debt in the next seven years. That was in August of 2011, and we said by 818, by August of 2018, could you be out of debt? Could you strive to be out of debt with everything? Could you say, I'm gonna be out of debt for everything but my house? Could you make some strides in this area? And you can join us on the journey, many of us, Between 30 and 40% of our church are on that journey right now. You see, debt creates conflict. Debt stifles generosity. Debt or financial issues are the number one cause of divorce. Maybe that's why we had over 160 couples on all of our campuses two weeks ago standing up here who had been married for over five decades. You see, the older generation wisely put off purchases and they replaced it with planning, prayer, and patience. And they have experienced what the Bible calls a peace that passes understanding because they've learned that true fulfillment and peace isn't found in a purchase, a place, or a possession. It's found in a person. His name is Jesus Christ. And he can bring much more joy than buying a home that you can't afford or purchasing a car to impress your coworkers. The rest of that passage in Matthew chapter six continues with Jesus telling us this in verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Here's the fourth challenge. Respect the past. Respect the past. Proverbs chapter four, verses one through four. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. For I too was a son to my father. 
still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and said to me, take hold of my words with all your hearts, keep my commands and you will live. Seek the counsel of people who have been around a lot longer than you have. Show respect to your elders. That's true whether you are 15 or whether you are 35 or 55 or 75. Do the simple things that may seem old school, may seem basic to some. Open the door for the woman. Allow others to, to go in before you do. Be appreciative. Be on time. One person, one senior adult said, if you send us a letter asking us to financially support you on your mission trip, and we do, then please write a brief note of appreciation and show your gratefulness. Respect was a term that continued to pop up. And I, I would hope that every generation would realize that there will always be differences in generations. I, I think we understand that. When I was growing up, some of the hot button issues were the length of, of a, a guy's hair or the mini skirts that girls wore. Then it's centered on facial hair for guys. Well, can you have a mustache? Well, no beard, but you can have a mustache and all sorts of different things. Can a girl wear a tube top? And, and then it became discussions after that over tattoos. And then the trend began of pants that hang down so far that you can see the person's underwear as they walk around. Hey, there will always be something, all right? But the Bible and modesty always have to be the determining factor when it comes to styles and fashion. But it would be foolish to never look to the past to learn from it, to never value the good things. However, it would also be equally foolish to so value the past that we never move into the future. You've heard me say that death comes when our memories of the past supersede our vision for the future. But there are things that we need to learn and treasure from years and generations past, and these things can actually help to lead us into the future. So young people, don't roll your eyes when a musical style or an old hymn touches the heart and soul of your grandparent. Just be thankful for the fact that their heart is receptive and that they allow their heart to be touched and changed, even though it may be a different preference of style than what you have. Well, here's the final challenge from the older generation to today's youth, and I, I love this. Become a catalyst for spiritual revival. That's their overriding challenge that they would want to give to, to young people. Become a catalyst for spiritual revival. First Timothy chapter four, verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Our culture desperately needs young Christians who are serious about their faith. Teenagers who don't just play at church. Students who are, are sold out. One person said, I can't do as much as I used to be able to do. My health isn't what it used to be. But they said, I can pray. And so that's what they do. One of the biggest things that our older generation can do is they... They can pray for our younger folks, that those kids will be dependent, that those young adults will trust in their walk with God, not their walk with their career, not their walk with stuff and worldly pleasure and technology and money and all those things, but their walk with God will be preeminent. Did you know that every major revival, reformation, or awakening in our world has begun from two things? Prayer and from young people. Those two things, prayer and young people. And the older folks in our church who responded to this survey were very candid in what they said. Many said they wished that they would have been more bold in their faith from the start, in their teen years and in their college years. And they pray that the younger folks would choose to, to be that way from the start. They said they hope that the younger generation embraces God's provision and God's wisdom and God's standards. And future generations have an amazing opportunity to build on the godly heritage of this church. And many of you young people, you are so blessed. You have a family tree of a parent, of grandparents who, who walk with Christ. 
And to think that you can build off of that legacy. I mean, you are so blessed. If you are under the age of 30, we are looking to you. Because if you are totally sold out and you are wholly committed, you can make a difference for Christ. And we are living in very uncertain times. I mean, just think about it. Three months ago, we had never heard the term ISIS. We'd never heard Ebola. And yet now, our news stories and our water cooler conversations are dominated by those two topics. And whether you realize it or not, both or either can have implications and ramifications for the missionaries that we support as a church, the missionaries that you support individually around the world, people that we love all around this country. Those things can have implications even for some of us in this room. We are a very cocky culture. And Americans say, ah, you know, come on, ISIS, I mean, come on, that's 4,000 miles away. ISIS states as their number one objective is to eradicate Christianity. You don't think that has repercussions for you and me? You better watch. Ebola, you say, oh, come on. I mean, that, that's, that's not gonna affect us. That's over in West Africa. Well, then it came to Dallas. And then someone with Ebola went to Cleveland on an airplane. And then there were some others that we're not sure if they're affected or not, but they're on a cruise ship now. And if you know anyone who's been to Dallas, been on airplanes, or been on a cruise in the last couple of months, and all of a sudden, it starts to get really close to home. You see how quickly things can change. And I'm telling you, the next 10 years, casual Christianity is not going to cut it. And so we say to our students, we need you. We don't need you to be a Christian because of the opportunities that this church has for, for students, all the great programs and great trips and all those things. Those are super, and I hope you do all those things. But that's not why we need you here. We need you here because you need to be in training. The older need to mentor the younger. Your faith needs to be deepened so you can make a difference because it's gonna be tough to be a Christian a decade from now. And God has put his hand on so many of you teens and college students and young adults and we are pulling for you and we are praying for you and we are counting on you to start a revival that changes the world and we will be your prayer partners and we will come alongside of you and we will disciple you and we will mentor you and we will support you. We just ask that you have a teachable spirit and that you're willing to learn from the years. My dad and I, uh, this year we're serving on a committee where we're helping to plan the North American Christian Convention. And this is kind of a treat for us because we've never been in a setting like this before working on the same project. And there's a yearly two-day meeting each October. And, and so we enjoyed a couple weeks ago just having the opportunity to, to get to catch up. And we'd sit together in some of these meetings. And we got to hang out some. And we even roomed together in the hotel. We, we, I can't tell you the last time we had done something like that. We had so much fun. But that night when he was getting ready to go to bed, I, I had my laptop out and I knew I was gonna be working for another hour, hour and a half on, on a talk I was finishing that I was delivering the next day. And we'd stayed up much later than, than he's accustomed to staying up. And my dad's 78. And I said, hey, I said, uh, you wanna pray together? before you go to sleep? He said, I'd love to. And uh, I said, how can I pray for you? And he told me some things. He said, how can I pray for you? And I shared some things with him. And then we bowed our heads and I prayed for him like I'd done countless times before through my youth. And then he began praying for me like he had done countless times before. And I can't tell you the last time we'd been in a setting where it was just the two of us, not the whole family praying together. And as he prayed, I listened, but something happened about halfway through his prayer. I decided to open my eyes. I just wanted to soak it all in. 
I just wanted to have this visual picture of my dad's humility and his sincerity and his integrity and his fervor for Christ because that's a model that I wanna follow and so I wanted to see it in my mind for many years to come. We have so much that we can learn from these warriors of the faith, longtime believers, godly senior citizens of whom it can be said, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And so to the godly veterans who have paved the way for many of us and pointed us to follow God's word and God's advice and God's leading, today we say thank you. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you and we say, may all who come behind us find us faithful. Will you give us wisdom and discernment as we strive to pass the baton of faith on to another generation? May we learn from the years of those who are ahead of us. May we teach those who are younger than us. And in all, may we be a model of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you've never turned your life over to Jesus Christ, we want to extend that opportunity to you where you say, I swallow my pride, I repent of my sins, I confess that, that Jesus is, is God's living son and that I want to live for him. You're obedient by being baptized into him, which symbolizes his death and his burial and his resurrection. It's a drama for others to see. And then you say, I want to live for Christ the rest of my life. There are others of you who have already made that commitment and you might say, well, today's a day for me to become a part of this, this church family. And whatever your decision is, I would just challenge you, don't put it off. Go for it today. Meet me down front as we stand together and worship.